Hello, welcome to Chair Beckert's GovCom podcast, where we discuss current government contracting trends, compliance matters, and best practices to guide government contractors forward. My name is Eric Poppy. I'm a senior manager with Cherry Becker, and with me today is Rich Wilkinson, director of product marketing from Uninet. Um, and today we are actually uh, talking about having our fourth podcast in our series on indirect rates, and uh, we will be talking about the dreaded incurred cost submission. And Rich, thanks for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure, Eric. Rich, before we jump in, do you want to just give a quick background um, about yourself? Oh, sure. Uh, I've been around the GovCon industry way longer than I like to admit. I was a Navy contracting officer for eight years, spent 10 years as a working controller. And then uh, I've been in the software industry pretty much ever since, more than 25 years. Uh, well, developing accounting systems mostly for government contractors. So, so you know all the ins and outs of systems, chart of accounts, setting up your rates, allocating them correctly, and then defending them, it sounds like. Yeah, I've wielded the stick, and I've been on the receiving end of it. Um, well, I, you know, I'm excited for this discussion today because uh, the incurred cost submission, you know, it's, it's something that people are always dreading putting together. Either it takes a really long time, you're pulling di- items from all different sources, if it's GL detail, if it's billing information, project, um, project cost detail, you know, it's, it's definitely a administrative hurdle each year. Uh, but, you know, to start us off, can you just give us a quick background on when an incurred cost mission is required? Sure. I mean, basically, anytime you've built an indirect rate that has to be finalized before you can close the contract, you're going to need an incurred cost submission as a basis for finalizing that rate. Now, most of those contracts are going to have the incurred, I mean, the allowable cost and payment clause in them. And that's the clause that triggers the requirement to uh, submit an incurred cost proposal. It's in all cost type contracts, but it's also in all T&Ms. Because the M part of a T&M is cost reimbursable. So we get that question all the time, and I'm sure you do too. Like, hey, I don't have any cost plus work. I only have TM and fixed price. Why the heck do I need to submit this incurred cost mission if I only have TM work? Yeah, um, and it's a two part answer. First, the clause is in the contract, it says you have to. And you don't want to refuse to do it because if you get it loggerheads with the government, they have a lot more paper and pencils than you do, and they can write you nasty letters forever. But second, someday you're going to have to close out those TNM orders on that TNM contract. And if you've applied GNA to the non-labor cost, the travel and materials, somehow you've got to substantiate that rate and finalize it before you can close that contract out. If you don't have any negotiated final rates and DCMA really puts the screws to you to, to close out those orders, they're going to just make a unilateral determination that their GNA rate is zero and ask for the money back. That, that is true. Yeah, it, it's definitely, um, so the short answer is still got to do it. Still got to submit that six months after the end of your fiscal year. You do. And it's it's an exercise in futility to resist, to write letters to DCA or your ACO saying you don't need to do it. Uh, uh, it's, it's not worth your time. Just send something in. Now, worst case, they're going to come back and say it's not adequate. You need to send more, uh, but send them something. Let them know that you're not ignoring them. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's- there are times, by the way, when zero is the right number. Yeah, I've I had a client a couple of years ago that only had a couple TNM contracts, and they had only applied GNA to some travel cost. We were talking a few hundred dollars, and I told the client. Just write them and tell them that you'll accept a zero GNA, and you'll write them a check for the GNA that was applied to those uh, travel costs and give it back, because the few hundred bucks you'll spend on that is way less than what you'll pay me to do an incurred cost submission for you. That's a very good point. <laughs> um, now you know. Say that company decided to submit their ICS, but they weren't able to submit it on time. You know, what are what are some of the consequences of having a late submission and, you know, how do you go about doing that? Well, first of all, sending it in on time is absolutely the preference. Yes. That's what you should do. OK, but anytime 
you tell a government contractor that's the requirement, that's the rule. Uh, they act like teenagers. Okay, the first thought through their head is, well, what happens if I don't? And it should be, because the answer in this case is, you know, not very much. Yep. If you miss the deadline by 30 days, nothing happens. Now, theoretically, it pushes the, the statute of limitations out day for day if you're late submitting your proposal. But that's largely theoretical. Nobody hits the statute of limitations without getting an audit anyway. And you would have to hit the six month mark late before you would get a letter from DCAA or DCMA with nasty words in it or threats or anything like that. So if June 30 is a real problem and it needs to be July 15th or July 31st or even September 1st, that's not a deal breaker. Better to send in an adequate submission a few weeks or even months late than not to do it or send it in on time but missing key pieces because they're just going to send it back. I agree there. Um, the one thing I have, we have seen some variation with different um, offices, different DCA offices in, different, in the different regions on uh, actually notifying the contractor, hey, we haven't seen received your ICS yet. You typically send it in. Where is it? We have seen that sometimes. Um, the one thing, though, is that if you do request an extension, if you do have a, what we've seen is that if you, if you have a track record of not submitting on time, that might be your one reason for getting that extension, especially if the long extension, say you have multi years backed up or something along those could be yeah. a few reasons to reject that extension. Um, so you're playing a little bit of that goodwill game with DCAA and your your contracting officer as well, I think, to consider. But yeah, they're, they're not too much of a consequence. No, and, and requesting an extension, first of all, let me say it's a good idea because it does buy you a little goodwill from DCAA and they're going to take uh, first of all, they're going to go to the ACO. They're not going to respond on their own. And second, ACOs are very busy. It's going to take him a month to respond. By then, you've probably already submitted it. But you let them know you're working on it and you're not ignoring them. And that's kind of important. So it's a good thing to do. They're almost, my experience and the clients I've worked with, is that nine times out of 10, they're going to deny it. Yeah. But nothing happens. It, you know, it's a, I think it's definitely a, a dance when it comes to working with DCA and your ACO on that. Um, you know, we have a few minutes left, and I really want to talk about the submission of the ICS, you know, and then the audit itself. Um, so, you know, what we've been seeing recently with DCAA, especially as we've gotten caught up with these incurred cost submission audits and being um, subbed out to third party accounting firms. You yeah. know, these the incurred cost audits being bucketed into low, medium, and high risk. In low risk, um, you know, maybe not even getting audited or getting audited once every two, three years in, in these bundle formats. Do you have any just general comments about the audit process? Yeah, you know that that client that only had a few hundred dollars at risk, um, if if they had actually sent in an, an incurred cost submission, it would have made sense to wait and see if they're going to end up in the low risk bucket, because if they do, there's no audit, no nothing. They just accept your rates as submitted. And that's happening to about half of all the incurred cost submissions that go in right now. DCA got 3000 new incurred cost submissions last year. They cleared 1500 on low risk memos. So half of everything they got last year they they're not they're never going to look at they're just going to accept it and the acos the aco is not going to go back to dca and say no no i don't agree audit this it just does not happen you know i think that hits a really good point to what you said before if you have to submit late submit uh, don't submit something that on time that's inaccurate or not tidy right. not complete because if you submit it late and you know very a very clean submission that would probably help in that to get in that clean bucket for low risk. Especially if they look at it and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. If all the, if you use their ICE model, and I highly recommend it because it's what they expect to see, they like to see it, it makes them feel good when you use their model to submit your ICS. If you do that and all the, the bottom lines tie out from schedule to schedule, a lot of times that's as far as they look. 
even if they audit, if it's a small contractor and relatively low risk, they're not supposed to do a low risk memo if you've never had an audit before. So even if it's the first audit, if it's a nice clean proposal on their ICE model, they may not even look beyond just tying everything out. Now, if they do come in, I'm sure you have some advice for people about what to, to be prepared for. Yeah, you know, I, the first thing, if, if when, I, when the audit does happen um, and they come in, you're going through your walkthroughs, you know, I we always suggest uh, offering to do a walkthrough of the submission itself and show the tie out to a system generated trial balance. Yeah, um, that's a great idea. And, and show how you can pull up the trial balance live, provide a copy, and that it will tie out to the, the main components of your schedule B through E that make up your rates themselves. E, of course, ties into the, the contract schedules as well. Um, the other thing is make sure you have all of your documentation when it comes there, when it comes to potentially timesheets. Um, we, you know, you and I have talked before about having legal and consultant um, agreements and invoices ready to go. Um, and then, of course, anything that's considered potentially high or medium risk from a, uh, a rate or from a, a GL account standpoint are always you know, easy pickings when it comes to allowability. Right. And legal costs are always an issue. Um, you need to show a summary of the actual legal matter. Yep. Uh, have your attorney provide that along with the invoice and make sure there's no confidential client attorney privileged information in that summary because you don't want to get cornered and have to give them uh, the actual work product. You don't have to, but if you don't, you can question it. So get a good description of the matter that uh, will show that it's one of the allowable exceptions. Otherwise, they're going to assume it's unallowable. And of course, with consultants, you've got to have that work product. You know, the one thing we ran into last year that surprised us, and I ran into it four or five times, was DCAA comparing timesheets to expense travel expense reports mm -hmm. to make sure that the charge number that was on the timesheet was the charge number that was being charged for the travel on that day. You know, we, we actually saw that last year, too, and that made me recall another thing that happened last year was um, we had actually had some auditors ask for a full GL dump. Uh, and they were looking for adjusting journal entries and transfers. Um, yep, corrections. And, and correction, yep. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of be prepared for anything, any of these requests that might, anything that goes into the ICS, you know, there could be a question that comes. Absolutely. So we're about to, uh, you know, I'd let, we're about up on time. Any closing thoughts on the ICS? No, except that, you know, it, it's not as hard as it sounds, and it's not as hard as everybody makes it out to be. If you approach it logically, use the ICE model and just go schedule by schedule, putting the data in and tying out the numbers. First thing you know, you're pretty much done. I mean, there's some schedules that don't come out of your accounting system, and that'll require a little bit of digging into documents. But the ones that come out of the accounting system, they're just not that hard. There's no reason to put it off. Very true. Well, Rich, I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. And, um, you know, it's been great doing this podcast series with you. Always a pleasure, Eric. I look forward to the next series. Looking forward to it. Thank you.